So I think uh, preparing for written exams, uh, uh, the most important thing is that uh, the examiners are uh, looking for safe anesthetists uh, with good sense of judgment, right? For uh, many of the questions that are uh, associated with uh, clinical practice, uh, there's never a single right or wrong answer. There are various possibilities. Uh, but when you actually uh, do decide to, you know, uh, go with one of the possibilities, it's important that you're able to justify it. And like I said, when it is, uh, there are two aspects uh, associated with your professional skill. Uh, and first of them is the knowledge, uh, which is the tool of all the professionals. Okay, if you're knowledgeable, uh, whether you're building a bridge or a building, or uh, whether you are actually constructing a rocket, uh, your knowledge is the most important thing. And uh, judgment uh, is whether you know how to use uh, these tools, and that is uh, use this knowledge. Applying this knowledge uh, is important, equally important. Okay. So the less knowledge you have, uh, less equipment you have for solving day-to-day -day, uh, problems in anesthesia, okay, in the operation theater, intensive care, or whether you're dealing with uh, pain management. And this knowledge uh, comes uh, from uh, you reading books, attending lectures, attending seminars, and the more you read, the more you listen, the better you get, okay. And uh, our uh, anesthesia group provides you also a uh, kind of a peer group that allows you to uh, you know, share your uh, knowledge, uh, try to share your uh, problems. So if you have any issues which you are not able to understand, you can always come back uh, to us and discuss further. So even though today's lecture will be over, so if you did not understand anything, you can actually come back to me and ask the question and clarify the answers to them, okay. So judgment and experience also comes, uh, you know, you've been in theater with uh, your colleagues, uh, learning uh, about anesthesia in the operation theater, in the intensive care, in the pain clinics. Okay, that, that's where you get the experience and the ability to make the right judgment, okay. And this experience and uh, knowledge helps you to handle complex problems and uh, when something uh, out of the blue turns up, you're able to apply this knowledge. You said, I have seen this, I have done this, or I have been in a situation like this with my seniors, and this is what they did, so this is what I'm going to do. All right. And you can always uh, you know, modify it slightly uh, depending on the situation of the patient because uh, no patient is the same, even though the condition may be the same, there's no. So before examination, you need to prepare, you need to read, and you need to practice, okay. So preparation, uh, important from uh, exam question books, the previous year questions. You need to read some of the recent uh, reviews or review articles uh, in the journal, at least uh, uh, one to two years uh, of the recent ones. Um, this should be from the peer review journal, um, the popular ones, uh, like for example, in India it is, in the Journal of Anesthesia, uh, from uh, Britain, the British Journal of Anesthesia, from US Anesthesiology, Anesthesia Analgesia, and from Europe, European Society of Anesthesia uh, Journal, so ESA Journal. So these, these are important. Also, uh, you can actually uh, write down your answers, discuss it with your seniors, or even ask them to correct your answers, okay? And uh, this way you actually get prepared for that, okay? And uh, when you're going for exams, make sure you actually have spare pens. Uh, take color pencils because I'm going to show you today uh, why you need those uh, color pencils. Okay, it's important to divide your time. Okay, uh, try not to overrun and uh, uh, have a watch or a clock in front of you. And also, actually, uh, do have some blank sheets uh, to actually form uh, your answers. Actually, have an outline. And I discussed about this, how outline actually helps. So if you actually have three hours of paper, uh, I think uh, at least uh, 45 minutes to 16 minutes, uh, you should actually spend in uh, writing your 
plan for each of this uh, question one by one. So if you actually have got 12 of the questions, you spend five minutes each, that is 12 into five, 60 minutes. Uh, you actually have the outline for each and every of the question, and then you actually transcribe it uh, into your uh, paper. So that actually, uh, you know, at the end when you're getting exhausted because at the end of three hours, you're not having the full energy, you actually have already have a plan which you can put on your sheet. So. With this, I think we will again uh, go through uh, the question and answers in a minute. So it's like in any exam, some questions are going to be easy. Uh, some questions are going to be difficult and you should be able to handle all of them equally well. Okay. So coming to the first question of the day is on anatomy and regional anesthesia. Uh, this is about uh, describing the anatomy of the nerves uh, with the help of a diagram at the ankle which supply the foot. Okay, so not a very difficult question. And then, then it's a clinical question, so list the techniques that can be used to provide analgesia for surgery on the foot. Actually, anesthesia, analgesia for foot, for foot surgery, right? So this actually says 30% on that. Actually, the other person was 70%. So maximum marks uh, were for the anatomy. The reason being that if you understand the anatomy, uh, then you can actually provide the anesthesia and analgesia for that. So we all know that uh, there are actually fine nerves that supply uh, the uh, leg. The main nerves actually come from the sciatic and femoral. Okay. So uh, below the knee, uh, the main uh, nerves are from the sciatic and these are through the tibial nerves, uh, superficial and uh, deep peroneal nerves and the pseudonerve. nerve. Pseudo nerve is uh, completely uh, uh, you know, sensory. And uh, one branch from femoral and that is saphenous again, which is sensory. Okay. So how do you draw diagrams? Okay, so I have got actually made a video where I have actually drawn the diagrams and I will I'll post it on the group later. And this is just to make uh, show nice diagram. So if you want to draw angle, you first draw a circle or semicircle. Okay, in the middle, you actually have a, a sort of rectangular block and on each side, you have a semicircle, right? So this is actually uh, describing the two malleoli, the medial malleoli and little malleoli. So you put down uh, things I say, is this on the lateral side, this on the medial side, right? And at the back, uh, we have the Achilles tendon. In the front, we have one artery. This is dorsalis pedis artery. And next to it lies the tendon that is the extensor pallus longus tendon. So you need to also continue marking. So I've not actually marked all of them with the lines, but you need to actually do that. Okay. And between the artery and tendon lies your deep perineal nerve. Okay, so that's the deep perineal nerve. So that's where you're gonna block it. So you're gonna feel for the artery, go a little to it between the uh, tendon and the artery and deposit local anesthetic and you will be able to uh, block the deep perineal nerve. Okay. Then lying uh, under cutaneously are number of branches. I've only shown one, but there are quite a few of these. Uh, so these are the superficial peroneal nerve uh, on the most on the, uh, you know, uh, aspect of the foot, anterior aspect of the foot. And on the medial side uh, lies the branches of the saphenous nerve. So that is the saphenous nerve. Now lying posterior to the medial malleoli, there is actually the artery, and this is the posterior tibial artery, and lying deep to this lies our posterior tibial nerve. And then on the lateral side, between the Achilles tendon and the lateral malleoli, uh, lies the sural nerve. So these are the five nerves. And like I have said, uh, the uh, four nerves, the deep peroneal, superficial peroneal, sural, and the posterior tibial, they arise from the uh, sciatic nerve. And the saphenous arises uh, as the continuation of the femoral nerve. And this is a sensory nerve. So saphenous and sural are the sensory nerves. If you're a little bit artistic, you can also actually uh, use your art, but this is a simple diagram. So, okay, so the same thing uh, with a foot, and it says that the extensus halus is longest tendon, and uh, going in the artery going across, okay, dorsal speed artery, the nerve between them, deep peroneal nerve. And uh, when you infiltrate across from the medial to lateral malleoli, on the medial side, you block the saphenous nerve, on the lateral side, you block the superficial peroneal nerve. So it's exactly like a 
uh, semicircular uh, cutaneous block uh, for the superficial and uh, the peroneal, superficial peroneal and the saphenous nerve. Okay. And uh, coming to the that so that's a heel and you draw a tendon on either side. You can actually draw your malleoli. Okay, the medial lateral malleoli. And uh, that's the artery behind the medial malleoli and the uh, the tibial nerve. So you got the posterior tibial artery and nerve. And when you deposit local anesthetic behind the uh, nerve, you get to the, the uh, tibial nerve block. Okay, sural nerve is cutaneous and but you go between the heel and the little malleoli, sorry, the, the, between the Achilles tendon and malleoli, cutaneous infiltration, you block the sural nerve. Okay. So just with some simple diagrams, we could actually describe the anatomy and the uh, blocks. And now coming to the local anesthesia for four foot surgery, well, uh, you could actually use a shotgun approach to it. Okay, so even though they're operating just on the four foot, you could still use subarachnoid block or uh, lumbar block, right? You can block the sciatic nerve at the hip. So you can actually use classical sciatic nerve block. You can uh, do a Ross approach to the sciatic nerve at the hip. Or you could actually just block the sciatic nerve at the popliteal fossa before it divides into common peroneal and tibial nerve. <clears throat> you can also uh, do the ankle block as we have described. Okay, you can also use intraosseous nerve block where you go uh, between uh, the metatarsals, uh, deposit local anesthetic uh, between the metatarsals, and uh, you know you can actually do foot. Or you can actually do local infiltration. Local infiltration will only take care of the pain coming from the skin and maybe you could get bit of uh, from the tendons, but you are not going to actually get pain relief uh, from the bones, cutting of the bones. And for that, you would need to supplement your analgesia, maybe IV ketamine, dexmetomidine or whatever. Okay, so uh, that is uh, the first question of the day. All right. Now coming to the second question, the second question is also on basic sciences. And uh, this is on physics. And this is about uh, surgical diathermy. So it says, the question is, uh, uh, what are the basic principles of surgical diathermy? And uh, what are its potential problems? Okay. So this is a graph uh, which actually shows uh, us uh, on the x-axis, we have the frequency. Then on the y-axis is the current. So if you look at, at the frequency uh, between uh, 10 and uh, 100 hertz, um, the frequency which is used uh, in the homes, that is 50 to 60 hertz, that is the frequency at which excitation and damage to excitable tissues like muscle and nerves occur. But as the frequency increases in the kilohertz and megahertz range, you actually see the heating effect. Okay. And that is the thing that the higher frequency causes heating effect. So it can pass easily through this tissue without exciting them. Okay. But it produces the heating effect and that is what the diathermy uses. Okay. So the diathermy use a high frequency which range between 300 kilohertz to two megahertz. And because the current is on the tip of the electrode, so that is your cutting electrode, the, and the, because of the high resistance at this frequency and because it is acting on a smaller area, the product of the current and the resistance uh, causes a lot of heat, uh, which can be used for cutting or coagulation. So the diathermy tend to use sine waveform for cutting. They use damped uh, sine waveform for coagulation. And in cases of cystoscopic resection of tumors or prostate as used in neurology, they use a combined wave or something called blended uh, waveform uh, for this. And we'll see how these looks like. So uh, this is a graph of time uh, on x-axis and uh, the uh, voltage on the uh, y-axis. And that's how, it's a sine waveform. It's a regular, continuous sine waveform. This is used for cutting. 
When you use damp sine wave form, you can see intermittently, okay, and this is a, you can see it's a sine wave, but it's damped, okay. Increases and slowly decreases across, and this is uh, called a sine, as uh, so damped sine wave form, and this is used for coagulation, okay. So it is of lo lesser energy. But when you actually use this, so there is actually, you can look at this damp sine waves are actually, you know, there is a gap between them. But when you use these uh, continuously, okay, one after the other, so damp sine wave form, which is almost continuous, one after the other, uh, this is called a blend. Okay, this is what is used in neurological uh, procedures. So if you actually look at the uh, simple uh, diagram of a, a diathermy, uh, it obviously consists of a high power radio, uh, radio frequency oscillator. So power supply, obviously it needs to be popular. There is a, a control circuit, so modulator, this is where you say, oh, we need to go up to 30 to 60 or whatever the surgeons actually say. Mm -hmm. Then there is a coupling circuit. So uh, you have the uh, active act electrode, uh, which is given to the surgeon and the indifferent act electrode or plate that is applied uh, to the patient. Uh, on an area which is actually should have a good uh, blood supply. Okay. And there are obviously alarms uh, as well in them um, so that uh, when there is a disconnection uh, or if uh, the OU inadvertently, uh, the uh, surgeon presses the paddle, okay, they, they should alarm. So there is an alarm system as well. Okay. Uh, this is uh, not uh, really necessary, but if you can actually remember this, uh, this will be absolutely fantastic. So this is a simple diagram uh, which you need to know because the main concept is about current density. Okay, so I square R, it should be at the tip of the electrode, okay. So that semicircle is a body, okay. The gray thing is a plate and the wire, the blue wire actually going to the, uh, the diathermation. So when the surgeon actually touches the, uh, you know, area, the current density is maximum at the uh, tip. And that's where you get cutting or coagulation. And then it distributes to the electrode. That's how the circuit is completed. And uh, there is heat generated at the pad as well, but because it is actually on an area which has got high blood supply, uh, the heat will be dissipated. Okay, so that's where high density occurs. This is a low density current and the current passes and because this is a high area, the, uh, your heat get dissipated uh, in there. You don't sh see any burns. But if the pad does not, uh, it's only is uh, in contact with only a small area, then that's where you can actually get burns uh, at the uh, you know, area of the uh, pad, which are not very uh, common now. They used to happen the old times, but it doesn't happen now. So obviously the problems uh, with the diathermy is that uh, you can get electrical burns, uh, this sometimes can happen if the, uh, you know, the electric, oh no, the, uh, you know, the cutting uh, electrode or the active electrode is not uh, put away uh, in a queer and it's lying on the patient and somebody accidentally presses the, uh, you know, paddle, then this is. And like I said, if there's a poor plate contact, then it can happen. Or sometimes if there is an alternate electrical contact, then uh, the current can actually flow through that and um, then they can uh, get bonds with them. Then there are issues about diathermy and pacemakers. And obviously there are issues about fires and explosions. So these are the three main areas uh, which are concerned for diathermy. So we got a diathermy machine, we got electric electrode, we got a plate and this is plate has been earth. Now in the in the new diathermies, um, there is no earthing of the plates. Okay, uh, but older diathermies used to have this. So when the current flows through this, and there is increased density, not only at the tip of the active electrode, but also at the area uh, where there is only as uh, only a contact, partial contact. So there will be high current density happening at the point where there is only a small contact. So this is going to cause plate burns. Okay. Then if the patient is actually attached to a monitor that is also earth, then in that case, uh, the current can actually flow uh, to the electrodes and complete the circuit through the earthing. 
And there you get electrode burns. So it'll be burns along the electrode system. So that's how burns occur. Now fire and explosion normally uh, do not occur. Uh, but if there is uh, the surgeon actually has used alcoholic, uh, you know, cleaning solution, which has pooled, and then they use diathermy, then this uh, alcoholic solution can catch fire. Uh, it has happened, it's happened in our hospital a long time ago, uh, but that is quite possible. And if it catches fire, then patient can actually burn and, you know, it can spread around as well. Okay, so uh, burns and explosions can also happen. So coming to the pacemaker unit, uh, so uh, it's important that the diathermy um, monopolar diathermy is not used. It's not very safe, especially if the surgery is around the pacemaker unit or the electrode. So in the chest, it's very difficult uh, enough to justify using monopolar. So you can use bipolar diathermy, not monopolar. So when actually current passes uh, through uh, the area, okay, so what can happen is that one thing is that uh, at the tip, it's been generated at the tip of the pacemaker unit. And this also has got sensing unit. And uh, if uh, this is affected, uh, then the threshold potential may increase. And then the pacing, so when the patient actually has an arrhythmia or the need to be triggered, it doesn't trigger. Or the mechanism for sensing may be damaged completely. Okay. The second thing is that uh, sometimes uh, if they are actually using diathermy, then this activity which is generated by the diathermy itself on the, on the muscles uh, can be sensed as a intrinsic cardiac activity. So it's not, the heart is functioning fine, but uh, the uh, uh, senses, the pacemaker senses it as a uh, activity and it can cause inappropriate activation, okay. And if the uh, current passes to the pacemaker unit, uh, that can be damaged. Uh, but nowadays, the uh, shielding of the pacemaker unit is uh, very good. Uh, so it is very rare that it can be affected by radio frequency currents, or it can be affected uh, by the diathermy itself. So damage to pacemaker unit is uh, less likely. Uh, it's more likely that the damage occurs at the sensing unit or at the tip. Uh, of the pacemaker unit. So these are the problem. And I already explained about explosions and fires and explosions, which can happen with volatile substances, especially alcohol, uh, egg, uh, you know, clinic solutions. Uh, older times it was known with uh, the uh, you know, use of ether, uh, but, and that is not possible. Okay. So then we move on to the third question. This is on cardiothoracic anesthesia. Uh, this is about uh, double lumen tubes. So how do you confirm that a double lumen endobrinkle tube has been placed correctly? And outline the possible complication associated with this procedure. That is uh, introduction of double lumen tube uh, for isolation of lungs. Okay. Uh, we will have some more questions on this sometimes later, but this is very specific. Like I said, this is more of exam oriented questions. So we're gonna only talk about them. So before even we talk about the position of tube, it's very important that you have the right selection of the size and you all decide on what should be the length of insertion of the tube. So in males, it's 39 to 41 French gauge and females 37 to 39 French gauge. Uh, for small females, there are actually smaller tubes available as well. But also you need to remember that there are different sizes uh, by different companies. And I'll come to that in a minute. And uh, now the length to insertion can be decided on based on patient's height. So if a patient is 170 centimeters, uh, then from the incisors to the tip, it should be only 29 centimeters. And the distance outers by one centimeter for every 10 centimeter change in height. So if the patient is 180 centimeters, then it becomes 30 centimeters from the incisors. Okay, and so on. So the way we detect the position of the tube, classically, it was auscultation based. So we auscultate both lung sides uh, after inflation of the uh, tracheal uh, cuff and the bronchial cuff. But now it is recommended that it should always be done under bronchoscopic guidance. 
So based on the X-ray, uh, we can actually know the size of the trachea. So uh, these are different, uh, you know, companies that makes double lumen tube, and you can actually see that on the on the chart that 9.6, 8.2, 11.4, 12.2, 2, these are the sizes of the trachea which are being measured on the chest X-ray. Okay. And based on that, we can actually decide what should be the size of the tube. And uh, so, uh, so if you can actually see that with the rush, when the size is 13, that is uh, correspond to 41 French gauge. Okay. Uh, when it's 11.2, it is 35.4. Uh, but with Portex, with 11.8, it is 37 French. So different companies have different external diameters uh, for the double limit tubes and you need to be aware of them. So using the same tubes, uh, I think actually helps in, this, in one institute, they tend to use a similar kind of tubes rather than having different tubes. So you can actually use uh, the uh, radiological methods of uh, detecting what kind of size of tube, rather than just estimating it that I say, well, all the patients should have 35, or females should have 32 to 35, males should have 39, 37 to 41. Uh, you just, uh, you know, you can use the X-ray guides. So once uh, the um, uh, tube is uh, introduced, you do laryngoscopy as you would. And most of the time we tend to actually use a left-sided tube because they are easy to insert. Right-sided tube can also be inserted. You got that. And what you do is you inflate the tracheal cuff. You actually uh, should actually get air going on to both sides of the lung. So there should be air on both sides. And you can also clamp the, the uh, bronchial lumen uh, for doing that. So, okay, so when you ventilate, you should get a good oxygenation on both sides. Then we are going to actually inflate the bronchial cuff and then you clamp uh, the tracheal lumen and you should get no air entry on the right side and only get air entry on the left side. So that's that. Then uh, we actually, uh, you know, clamp uh, the bronchial lumen and ventilate the lungs. And then you should be able to ventilate just the right side. That means there is no leaks and then you're okay, just fine. But like I said, bronchoscopically, uh, we are now actually like say we need to do it under bronchoscopic guidance. When you introduce the tube, uh, uh, once the tracheal uh, cuff is inflated, you can measure the distance uh, between the tip of the uh, tracheal lumen and the carina. And uh, the uh, tracheal lumen cuff should be at least one to two centimeters above the carina. Okay. And then we start looking uh, for the inflation of the uh, bronchial cuff, which is actually blue in color. So B for uh, bronchial, B for blue. Okay, so bronchial, and they should be able to actually inflate it uh, under direct vision. You have to look at it. Uh, you should be able to see uh, the right uh, main bronchus. You should be able to see the carina, and you should be able to see the bronchial cuff, just just about visible. And you can then do in, uh, the inflation and that. Uh, okay. You can also then pass the uh, your bronchoscope through the bronchial cuff and then make sure uh, that the upper lobe of the left side uh, bronchus is actually also visible. Okay. For right sided tubes, you can actually place the, bron the uh, bronchoscope through that and uh, uh, to the Murphy's eyes, look at that you're able to actually see the right upper lobe coming off. Okay, so that's for inflation. Otherwise, the tests actually are the same. So, very few uh, indications for you using the right side tubes. Mostly, uh, well, we use uh, left sided double limit tubes. Also, it's important that if you are actually positioning the patients changing from supine to uh, the lateral position, uh, that you again uh, you know, have visualized uh, the, uh, you do auscultatory method if you are not got a bronchoscope, but if you got a bronchoscope, make sure that there is no malposition of the bronchial or tracheal cuffs. It's not moved out or moved in. Okay. So complication related to double lumen tubes, uh, they are bigger than normal size tubes. So they can be a trauma during insertion and rotation. Uh, it's the way that uh, the tubes are introduced and then you actually rotate it to the left side as you go into the bronchial, okay. okay. So during rotation. Uh, trauma can occur to the larynx and the supraglottic uh, structures, your retinoid uh, dislocation can occur, okay. If you're not careful, you can also cause disruption of tracheobronchial tree, especially 
uh, while uh, inflate the uh, bronchial cuff is inflated and you have repositioning uh, the patient and uh, that can happen. Malpositioning is probably the commonest of the complications and nothing great. You can always ask the surgeons to stop surgery. You can actually reposition them, uh, you know. So especially if you've got bronchoscope, it's so much easier to do that. Occlusion of main bronchus can occur and there could be failure to achieve adequate uh, lung separation. Okay, and uh, because of this, there can also be uh, difficulty in oxygenation at the same time, if there is no isolation, there can be contamination, especially if you're doing surgery uh, on uh, something uh, like, uh, you know, uh, empyma or other kind of surgery where there's uh, impact. So these are the complications of that. If you have any other in mind, let me know. Okay. So now we move on to uh, the um, question four. Uh, this is actually an interesting question. Um, it is outlined uh, with reasons of potential advantages and dangers for a uh, paralyzed patient to be placed in prone position. So this is an open question. This could be about intensive care. This could be about general anesthesia. And since it is not mentioned uh, what it is about, uh, we actually have to talk about both. Okay, so you will lose marks uh, if you actually concentrate only on uh, uh, one of them. So uh, make sure you mention both uh, the uh, uh, general anesthesia and intensive care. So even in COVID times, and uh, this is actually very important because uh, prone positioning has been used even in a way without anesthesia, but this is very specific. You say the patient is paralyzed. Okay, so that means you have to have an electrical tube, isn't it? So for general anesthesia, uh, prone position is off, obviously used for surgery on the back. It's going to be back of the neck, back of the, you know, chest, back, you know, lumbar area, thoracic area, <laughs> gluteal area. It can be used anywhere. It's some, some even the general surgeons uh, need to have patient prone if they're operating on the, uh, you know, uh, uh, some kind of uh, abdominal perineal resections or uh, gluteal areas. Okay. So that is so for mainly for access to surgery. But in patients with uh, in intensive care, this is used uh, in patients with severe lung disease. And the idea is to improve oxygenation. Okay, so uh, that is the commonest indication nowadays in the COVID time. Okay. So when you actually prone a patient healthy uh, with healthy lungs, what do you get? There is obviously improving oxygenation and uh, lung volume. It's um, you know, the way the lungs moves. Uh, but this is not dependent on uh, the mechanics. Okay, so the improvement in the oxygenation does not happen because of mechanics. Uh, rather, it is because of the ventilation uh, moves from dependent part of the lungs. And I will explain this with diagrams. Okay. There is obviously some reduction in chest compliance. It decreases by 10%. And uh, the, this is chest wall compliance uh, because the bucket handle kind of movement is actually restricted a bit. And if your uh, abdomen is not free, um, it can also impede uh, the movement of the diaphragm. Okay. And the lung compliance decreases by uh, uh, 5%. Uh, functional residual capacity does increase by 53%, but this is not the main cause for improvement uh, in the oxygenation. So ventilation perfusion matching improves due to anterior displacement of mediastinum. Okay, we will see again. Uh, there is decreased atelectasis in dependent regions. How, why this happened, we'll see again. And there is non-gravitational distribution of blood flow. Now, in normal sitting position, uh, the blood has to flow against gravitation because the heart is at the bottom. It has to pump against gravity. But when it is on top, the blood flow actually improves. Okay. So these are important things. Uh, but in uh, the ARDS, so this is looking at uh, a bad lung. Uh, in ARDS, there is increased extra vascular lung water uh, because of increased pulmonary vascular permeability. There's leaky capillaries everywhere. There could be diffuse alveolar damage and uh, the uh, distribution of edema is not uh, gravity dependent. You know, it's uh, 
you see the, that same um, ARD is long or heterogeneous. Okay, it doesn't happen just like uh, you know everything gravitate down. So the alveoli are restricted both by edema and uh, gravitationally dependent hydrostatic uh, forces. So there's leaky uh, capillaries, there's lots of fluid accumulating at the dependent area, and, but also uh, there are patchy areas all around an ARDS. And uh, there is compression at lactis in the dependent area because it's a boggy. It's like you take a balloon uh, filled with water and actually put it on the uh, table, you will see how the water actor distributes, it's all you know, gravitationally uh, dependent. So there's lots of things happening in the battle lines. So how does improvement in oxygenation occur? So like I said, there is a redistribution of intrapulmonary gases, okay? And also there is a, a reversal of hydrostatic pressures. Um, there is reduction in chest uh, wall compliance. This is not uh, the important thing. So despite restriction in uh, chest wall compliance and bit of lung compliance, there is still improvement in the oxygenation. Okay. So this is a, a nice diagram where we actually see all the alveoli compact. So the red line, uh, this is the area. So the alveoli, uh, which are below the uh, red line, uh, these actually have high airway opening pressure. So AOP, because this is the area. So the, the, uh, and the pressure, the gravitational pressure, uh, the blood, uh, which is actually around the alveoli, that is compressing the alveoli, right? So trying to pump in oxygen or air into this is not possible. The air will go to the uh, non-dependent area where the perfusion is also low because it's gravity dependent. The heart is pumping against the gravity up. So there is reduced uh, pumping. But when you actually uh, turn the patient prone, the flow is against the gravity. The blood is actually flowing. The heart is hanging on the top. And at the same time, you actually see that the lung tissue, uh, which are below the airway opening pressure is reduced, markedly reduced. So this is where redistribution uh, occurs again. So showing this in a simplified diagram, see which even you can draw in the exam. This is how the perfusion is. It's dependent, isn't it? So heart is pumping, pumping as a gravity. So at the top, it's markedly reduced. At the same time, if you look at the ventilation, the alveoli, there is no water in the top area, so they can open very easily if they remain open on most of the times. Whereas at the bottom, and they tend to open and close okay, because there is uh, you know, water around it and there's uh, you know, being pushed. So this is how the uh, ventilation perfusion looks in normal air. So in a bad lung, this is the area which is below the airway opening pressure, right? But when you actually have the patient prone, uh, this is what happens. So the perfusion is a lot more even, okay? So it is not gravity dependent anymore. And so is the ventilation, the tissues below the airway opening pressure is markedly reduced. And that's why there is better uh, a matching of the ventilation and perfusion, and you get better oxygenation uh, in the patients who are actually prone. So coming to the problems of proning, say this is in intensive care, this is courtesy Google. Uh, you can see there are monitoring, there are one, two, three, four, five, six people, and probably, uh, yes, there is one person on the top end as well. And there's patient is attached to lots of monitors. We need a lot of people, okay, isn't it? So the dangers of prone positioning will depend uh, on the, uh, whether it's uh, in the theaters, or in the intensive care. Um, in the intensive care, also patient is actually attached to lots of things. Um, so if you're not careful the way the patient is positioned, uh, we can have cervical spine damage. A need to, everybody need to move in coordination. Uh, they need to be training. You don't do it without training, okay. And the person on the head end is very, very important uh, because that's the one who is going to guide everybody. And uh, there can be patients, uh, uh, you know, access to face can be a problem. In theaters, we tend to use prone view or other methods where we can actually get to that. Uh, but they may not be used in the uh, intensive care. The head is actually usually kept to one side. But then the patient is actually uh, rolled from time to time. Everybody has got different protocols uh, for that. 
So access to uh, face is not much of a problem in uh, the intensive care. And because they're not operating. Now you can't, if you have eight hour surgery in the theaters, you can't suddenly tell the surgeon, oh, let's stop and actually move the head now. Right? So it's different from theaters and different from intensive care. And because the head is dependent, you actually see a lot of puffiness of the face, uh, which obviously um, would with time come down. We need to be careful with uh, pressure point, the way the uh, hands are moved. Uh, some people use Simmers view where the one hand is kept ahead and one of the back. Some people keep both around, one's in the side. So there are different ways of actually putting, but main thing is that you make sure that the brachial plexus is not stretched uh, we make sure that all the pressure points, whether it is the uh, uh, ulnar nerve or radial nerve or your femoral nerve or sciatic, these are all likely padded and they are free. Okay? They are easy to move. When you're moving the patient has got endotracheal tube, make sure it's well secure. Uh, the cannula, venous cannula, arterial cannula, central venous line, all these uh, need to be either, uh, you know, uh, in, they, we have to make sure that they're not entangled and they move with the patient. So there are training for the, how we actually make sure that. And like I said, we need uh, numbers for staff. You need lots of uh, uh, staff members. And uh, again, uh, the way the patient, at what level you want to have the patient. Uh, so the back injuries are again, uh, possible in the uh, staff. So there are issues of probably, And that's the reason why uh, a lot of uh, units may be reluctant it's easier for awake proning where patient prones themselves, but patients who are anesthetized and uh, who are ventilated, sedated, paralyzed, it's not an easy thing. So we need to actually be sure uh, that there is a lot of help around and these people are trained. So during COVID times, uh, uh, when things were bad, we actually had uh, uh, regular training uh, in the theaters for uh, people who were involved. And uh, we used to have proning teams uh, who would be actually be on the bleep or on their mobile phones. And when we wanted to prone patients, they would be actually called. So the proning teams were an important part. The fifth question is on transplant anesthesia. Uh, this is a patient who has undergone a heart transplant and require a non-cardiac surgery. It could be anything, it could be a small surgery like hernia or could be abdominal surgery. Okay, so what problems may this present for the anesthetist? Not, not everybody actually has to see a heart transplant patient, especially if you're not working in a, a cardiothoracic unit or we are standalone, but occasionally we get heart transplant patients uh, for non-cardiac surgery. Okay, I have actually uh, been involved in a few of them. So basically this is a denervated heart. The cardiac plexus is interrupted, uh, heart is denervated. Uh, there is a uh, re recipient heart, which patient is getting from, uh, you know, the donor. Okay, so and there is, uh, sorry, there is part of the recipient uh, atrium, which is already there, uh, which has, there is still a cuff of it. And there is a donor atrium as well. Okay. So the recipient uh, atrium is still innervated, but it has got no role in it because it's mostly excised. Uh, whereas the donor atrium is denervated, and this is where you get uh, the electrical, electrical activity to the heart. So it's not uncommon to actually see two P waves in a uh, patient who's had a uh, heart transplant done. And it does uh, it retain the heart, the donor heart does retain its intrinsic control mechanism. So the Frank Starling still works and their alpha and beta receptors. Uh, so they do respond to circulating catecholamines. So the only thing it doesn't have, it doesn't have a nerve uh, which respond, okay. And that's why it's a denervated heart. So it lacks the ability to uh, respond to when there is certain hypovolemia, hypotension. You would normally see tachycardia, you don't see any tachycardia in this. So uh, denervated heart uh, responds mainly by increasing the stroke volume. Uh, because like I said, there is this Frank Starling curves are still there. They do respond to alpha and uh, beta receptors. So there's no uh, neural, me neural mechanism is not uh, present. Uh, it has been seen that um, uh, there is some amount of renovation seen uh, within a year, even in transplanted heart. And uh, sometimes uh, despite it being a denervated heart, the patients can have symptoms of angina when ischemia actually develops in these patients. 
So what are the pre-anesthetic concerns in patients uh, with this heart? Uh, so we need to actually know histories of rejection and ventricular function. So the patient uh, ideally should have an echocardiogram. And um, you can actually know from the history of rejection, uh, they take frequent uh, biopsies uh, from the heart. Uh, so you can actually ask the patient if they has, has had recent frequent biopsies. These patients are prone to all kinds of dysrhythmia. So you can actually see ectopics everywhere, okay? So if you have a patient who has got a, a normal sinus rhythm, uh, they're normally tachycardic. And so uh, that's okay, but you shouldn't be surprised if you see uh, these patients. Uh, a lot of these patients, I think uh, probably five to 10% patients are obviously in AF, uh, but you can actually see all kinds of rhythms in there. Now, because these patients are on immunosuppressants, they can be on cyclosporine and uh, tacrolimus. Uh, these can impair renal and hepatic function. So it's important that uh, they actually have the renal function tests and the liver function test uh, before. And the patient can be on azathioprine for immunosuppression, and this can actually cause anemia and thrombocytopenia. So your full blood count is also equally important. And because of immunosuppression, they have uh, obviously high risk of uh, you know, contracting infection. Uh, so you need to actually use aseptic technique for everything. Okay, so from even if you're you know, venous cannula, arterial cannula, central venous lines, everything, and make sure they get appropriate antibiotic prophylaxis. Since these patients uh, are on steroids, uh, you have to make sure that they get their uh, replacement. Also, corticosteroids can induce um, diabetes and hypertension are common in these patients. So again, uh, make sure that uh, they are getting their appropriate uh, treatment. You might need to actually put them on insulin. And it's very, very important that they, uh, these patients are volume repleted. Like I said, uh, they respond by increasing their stroke volume. They do not respond through neurally mediated uh, response. So it's important pre-induction that their intravascular status is normal. Okay, So they're not dehydrated. This is very, very important. As far as anesthesia technique is concerned, there's no specific method or uh, you can give regional anesthesia technique you can use. You can use uh, general anesthesia, but if you, can, if you can use uh, the original techniques, nothing like it. Uh, but if you're using gel anesthesia, uh, make sure that you are able to, uh, you know, uh, extubate the trachea early. A lot of these patients might actually have combined heart and lung transplant and uh, having a ventilator associated pneumonias in this patient is not a good thing. And vasodilation is poorly tolerated, like I said, they do not have neurally uh, activated mechanisms. So you do not see the tachycardia, which happens with hypovolemia. And uh, you need to treat this with, uh, you know, intravascular volume rather than uh, uh, trying to depend on uh, vasopressors. And uh, that's another important uh, thing which will come to. As far as monitoring is concerned, uh, in the absence of rejection, graft function is uh, generally good. Uh, the graft function very well. So in most cases, non-invasive monitoring is usually that is always required. Uh, invasive monitoring should be chosen only for its usual indication. Now, if you're planning to at least uh, have a, a, a central venous axis, uh, use left IJV or subclavian because uh, the right uh, IJV is used for getting biopsies from the heart. It's easier to go through the right IJV rather than to the left. So, and you don't want it getting thrombosed. So if you can avoid using right IJV, avoid it completely, uh, use a left IJV. So in cases where you can think there would be, it's a much bigger surgery and there could be blood loss and uh, fluid shifts, so intraoperative monitoring can include artery line, central line, pulmonary artery catheter if you need to. Uh, and I think uh, if you can use uh, non-invasive methods like transesophageal echocardiograms, um, that would be actually a lot more useful uh, than trying to actually get uh, all this invasive monitoring. 
Uh, Post-operatively, you need to pay increased attention to preload status, so make sure that the fluids are prescribed, uh, monitor the renal function, and ensure there is uh, antibiotics prescribed, uh, asepsis is followed throughout, and the patient goes back on their immunosuppressants as soon as possible and get levels to make sure that the levels of immunosuppressants are right in these patients. So these are uh, some common issues. Now, uh, coming to the uh, other concerns, uh, emergency medications. Now, these patients do not uh, respond to indirectly acting agents. So they act better uh, with directly acting. So adrenaline, asoprodenol, dobutamine, dopamine, ephedrine. Ephedrine probably not that quickly because it does act indirectly. So ephedrine is not that. You might actually need to have pacing or external pads or internal wires uh, for that. Like I said, these patients can have any kind of dysrhythmias. Okay, so pacing, whether external pads, I would actually make sure that there are external pads attached to these patients. And when you are actually antagonized, you would actually use neostimian and glycopyrrolate. Uh, you need to be sure again that uh, you may not actually see uh, the anticholinergic effect as well as you actually see in normal patients. Uh, so uh, if you have, can use rocuronium uh, with sugomadex, that's the best thing ever. So you can avoid neostigma altogether uh, in these patients. Uh, so sugomadex would be a good indication. Now coming to the last question of the day, and uh, this is on obstetric anesthesia. We actually have a fit primary gravida, a gravida who suffers an inadvertent dural puncture with a 16-inch uh, G2 he needle during attempted epidural insertion for analgesia. In the first stage of labor, she was only four centimeters dilated. Describe your management of this complication. Now you are a trainee and you actually have done a dural puncture. How are you going to manage? Okay. So what are the issues with this? Obviously, there is a worry about uh, post-dural puncture headache. The question is, would you actually go for a second attempt? Answer is no. Okay. You will advise uh, them to use other options. And you would, if the patient actually insists that they only want an epidural, in that case, you will inform your senior. You will not re-attempt. Okay. So if it has to be reciting of that, it needs to be by senior. All the senior might say that, okay, just put in a spinal catheter and use it. That means you are going to be there all night with the patient, okay, because you need to top up and you need to monitor them much more closely. The second thing is there is actually, is it, should we actually be doing a prophylactic blood patch or not? And the answer is uh, probably not. There's no point in uh, doing a prophylactic blood patch uh, where you've already made a dural puncture. So, uh, if they need to do, anybody need to do a, a blood patch, that should be the concern. Even if you actually have done a dural puncture, it's, it's very much likely that even consultants can do it. It's not that uh, the consultants can't do the same puncture. So it's leave it to the seniors. Okay. Now in December, 2018, uh, the Obstetric uh, Anesthetic Association, OAA, uh, came up with a treatment for obstetric post-dural puncture headache management. And uh, what uh, these are some of the things they have said. And a lot of things they have said there is not enough evidence. Uh, bed rest, uh, yes, okay, initially, but again, make sure the patient is prescribed uh, prophylaxis for thromboembolism because lying in bed will increase the risk of thromboembolism. So that's need to be. Oral fluids, uh, no oral hydration, just normal hydration. Intravenous fluids only to prevent dehydration. That is when patient is not able to take you know, orally or they might be sick, you know, they've been having post nausea and vomiting. Abdominal binders, they said there's not enough evidence to use them regularly. <clears throat> uh, simple oral analgesic need to be prescribed for all of them. Uh, opioid analgesia, if simple oral analgesics are ineffective, then opioid analgesia can be used. With caffeine, there is limited evidence um, and they say the treatment should not exceed for more than 24 hours. And oral therapy is preferred and those should not exceed more than 300 milligrams with a maximum of 900 milligrams in 24 hours. That is a maximum dose of caffeine. 
Now, if the patients are also, you know, drinking tea and coffee, you need to make sure that uh, again, that is taken into consideration that they do have caffeine as part of their uh, treatment. So this is added. In patients who are breastfeeding, it's important to reduce the dose to 200 milligrams in 24 hours. So that is actually a, quite a low dose. And uh, what about other theophylines? There is not much evidence at all to them. Okay. What about ACTH and analogs? Again, insufficient evidence. Uh, steroids, adicone, dexamethasone, methylprednisone, silone, again, insufficient. Triptans, insufficient evidence. Gabapentinoids, insufficient evidence. Now, all these have been used in uh, patients to prevent uh, PDPH as part of pharmacological experience. Some people have said that it, they work uh, but if you look at overall, uh, if you do uh, look at the meta-analysis of these use, um, they have not been actually, um, has, there isn't even sufficient evidence for their use. So these all come from case studies or case series, small case series. Other uh, medication which have been tried like desmopressin, methyl, uh, gonorrhea, uh, ondocitron, and neostimulatropine. Again, these also have insufficient evidence uh, but they have been tried. Uh, invasive procedures like acupuncture, insufficient evidence, greater hospital nerve, coronary, insufficient evidence. Now, this is from 2018 uh, with more um, sphenopalatine ganglion block or combined block, like we have uh, published on using both together, which shown good results. Now, these are all case series. You know, you need to actually have bigger series to say that there is sufficient evidence to actually uh, make. Uh, you know, recommendations for their regular use. So like spinopalatine, insufficient evidence. Epidural morphine, again, insufficient evidence. Okay, so there isn't, uh, other than I think epidural uh, blood patch, uh, which is the only one uh, which has actually seen uh, to uh, have, you know, sufficient evidence to it. Um, so uh, coming to the end of lectures, um, well, I'm not actually clear yet. So, so people actually use blood patch, they use saline, dextrans, and et cetera. But other than blood, there isn't actually uh, any evidence for any of them. We need to be sure that uh, we don't use more than 20 ml. Uh, two uh, syringes of 20 ml are taken, and one of them is set for blood cultures as well, uh, in case patients develop any infection post-op, uh, we would know what bugs they have at Chrome. Uh, so the next uh, uh, series uh, will be uh, next Tuesday, but unfortunately I have a meeting that day. So we might actually have to actually change the time, but we'll try to actually keep most of them at uh, six o'clock uh, at the Indian Standard Time. Uh, so we probably uh, might be doing it around seven or eight o'clock next week. Um, and I will likely let you know the areas we will cover and uh, see you all. See, bye.